we'll talk about national security. What comes to mind? Uh, security, we know, is the state of uh, order and peace. So uh, national security is uh, protection uh, in the Kenyan context of Kenya against internal, Kenya the country and Kenyans the people, against uh, internal and external aggression, also protecting their rights and territorial integrity. Thank you very much. National security to me means all efforts that the government does and all organs that are responsible towards ensuring that the citizens of their country are safe. National security means the protection of its citizens and its resources and its boundaries. So when we are when we are giving this definition, what are we making reference to? What's guiding us in terms of looking at what national security is? What is guiding us is what forms a state. So we are looking at our borders and also I wanted to add that it's not possible for any nation to have security without also having food security. National security it's our this president or the president because the president is the commander in chief of the army forces. We talk of uh, it's a part of the rights, the human rights that we we have as Kenya, and uh, it's in our constitution, so it's a constitutional human right. Uh, maybe one more person and then we proceed. When you talk of national security, what comes in my mind is uh, about us, as a Kenyan nation, being able to protect our people, protect their rights, protect them from any threats that may come from other countries that are bordering us. And that protection comes just from ourselves, just within our nation. And it really is protecting ourselves from internal and external threat, our people, our property, our sovereignty, you know, from all the thre threats that we can envision, you know, locally and internationally. So as we're looking at what guides us when we're protecting ourselves from internal and external threats, we mentioned the Constitution, which really is our primary reference point, yeah? because there is no law in Kenya that's passed without making reference to the Constitution. And as much as the Constitution is really robust, we need supplementary legislation. That's where every other act of parliament comes in, and you know, the subsidiary legislation. So for instance, when we look at the, the Constitution, it doesn't necessarily make reference to how maybe the police would work, you know, um, how recruitment is done, but it says that national organs should work and the, the work needs to be prescribed by the constitution and acts of parliament. So when we're talking about national security organs, which organs are we talking about? The national security organs, we have the Kenya Defense Forces, the National Intelligence Service and the National Police Service. We have the National Security Council chaired by the president and we have the National Police Commission that is uh, responsible for recruiting police. When we're looking at the national security organs, uh, I tend to put them in three points, right? So first is Kenya Defense Forces, and then the National Intelligence Service, and then the National Police Service, right? So each of these three have their different categorizations and also who they report to. For instance, uh, when we're looking at the Kenya Defense Forces, right? they have, it's been categorized into three, yeah? So this is the military arm. So for instance, when we're facing threats from outside of the country, when um, we are, we're sending our troops to Somalia to fight as part of the Amazon army, it's the Kenya Defense Forces, the military that is over there, right? I'm sure we're, we're familiar with the Kenyan army in Somalia, right? Yes. Okay, great. So. As part of the Defense Forces, we have the Kenyan Army, the Navy, the and the Air Force. Right, so those three facets, right? Land, air, and sea, right? So we're covered all through. We, do we know the composition of the Defense Council? Can we take a guess? I'll say the Director General of the National Intelligence Service. The Cabinet Secretary for Defense. So keep in mind your answers. Uh, the Defense Council consists of Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Defense. National Intelligence Service. The role of the National Intelligence Service is to, I don't know which exactly word to use, they're, they're like informative, information 
um, center, just similar to the um, FBI's in the US. Now in this case, they like inform and are well versed with the int uh, intelligence over all the system, both the defense, the police service and others. The National Intelligence Service collects intelligence from various sources uh, depending on what uh, kind of information they want to get, for example, tracking terrorists and tracking other crimes happening in, within the country. The National Intelligence Service is simply uh, security intelligence and counterintelligence that enhances our national security. You've mentioned intelligence and counterintelligence and this body really just informs all the other national security organs in terms of doing their work in maintenance of peace and security. Okay? Right. There's something called the National Security Council, uh, which now is what leads all of the national security organs. So they take command. But when we were going through the national security organs, the National Security Council was mentioned, and essentially it is the organ that now cumulates all of them, yeah? So the Kenya Defense Forces, the DCI, the National Intelligence Service that we, we, we also saw. So we talked about the defense, we talked about the intelligence, and now we're talking about the National uh, Police Service, yeah? Uh, who was familiar with the recent reforms, police reforms. I remember there was a merging between the administrative police and, uh, is it the Kenya. Kenya police? Yeah, that is what I remember. But uh, the National Police Service comprises of the Kenya police, in, in accordance to the to the constitution, it comprises of the Kenya police, uh, administrative police, and the National Police Service. But I remember there was a merge between the administrative police and the Kenya police. I, I know two things that happened with the reforms. One is on uniform, changed from what they had to now the very bright blue. And then there was also an analysis in terms of what they own vis-a-vis -vis what they earn. Yeah. One of the police reforms uh, that is happening is specific to children. So we know in uh, many years, we've had children being taken to the police stations, being mixed up with adults. So what the government is doing is establishing child protection units in police stations. And uh, one model child protection unit is uh, in Kwale, next to the Diani police station. You will find that they have a child protection unit. It has beds, it has bathrooms, and they actually have a police officer who's specifically in charge of children. I think one of the other key things we cannot ignore with the police is the review of their salaries, which is just a hygiene factor but is as important. And also we have seen the issue of their housing being reviewed so as to motivate them uh, for the work that they do. So I want to talk about the Policare, where it's a one-stop shop, uh, where now the police have been trained to uh, to take care of the gender-based violence because with the issues that we have been complaining about uh, when somebody is violated and what they experience a police uh, force, now they went ahead and came up with the policy which is supposed to be implemented and have um, a central place in the police station where people are going to feel safe and share their stories so that they can get the right help. I think, uh, uh, when we talk about reforms, we cannot ignore, was it the Ransley Task Force? and the independent IPOA policing oversight authority to investigate the conduct of police officers. The only thing I think IPOA was established way before the launching of the police reforms, but you got it really right, the Ransley reforms was actually the commission that sat down and put together all these rules, yeah? And all of the things that you said were actually true. And for our discussion today, what is particularly important is the merging of the forces, yeah? We had the Kenya Police Forces and uh, the APs, right? They were both operating differently, yeah? But now they've been put together. So all of them three are now operating under the uh, Kenya Police Forces, uh, services, sorry, the National Police Services, yeah? It was a force before and now it's a service. Who knows? Why? One of the reasons why we had to do the reforms and match the police service is because there was a lot of infighting among the police, which was a threat to our security. And the other thing, the 
police in blue always felt that they were better than the APs. So there were, there were issues where maybe the APs could uh, arrest somebody and the police let you go. So all these things when they were done, they were supposed to assist in having one command and harmony. The police reforms from a, a force to a service. One, it was supposed to make it a professional body. Two, to make it more acceptable to the normal citizens so that a force doesn't look so friendly, but a service means they help work for the people or with the people. Then again, to help her uh, on the difference between the national police and the administration police, I am a teacher of history. We simply tell the students, the national police wanalinda watu. Administration police wanalinda vitu. And the Kenya police is mostly for peace and, um, and security, as, as she was saying, like policing, actual policing of people, you know? But the AP, I know you've been seeing them huko chini kwa ground. AP normally minajua, they're more friendly, you know? Yeah. You associate them with the chief's office. Yeah, they mostly deal with, you know, one-on-one -on -one. Uh, So we've lent someone something, they want to collect or whatever, you know, stuff like that. They are no, they're not at responding to conflict more so in, you know, using arms and sort of uh, um, artillery and the kind, right? Yeah, okay. I'm sure we all know the Directorate of Criminal Investigation. Yeah. As the name suggests, they actually do a lot of investigation uh, on crimes that are happening within our, our community and areas. And recently, I think it started, I don't know if it last year or this year, they started uh, sharing stories of what's happening. If, if, for example, something has happened in Mombasa, there was a day that a young person in Mombasa was killed. So after the investigation they have done, or even when they are doing the investigation, they share with the people for us to get to know what's happening. It was not happening a while back, but I've seen that recently they've started doing that for the people to know. So their work is mainly to investigate um, crimes uh, within our society and locality. As per a recent report by the president, so it's an annual report on parliament on the state of national security. It lists down close to 29 29 things that are a threat to our national security. This is a recent report of 2020. I'm not sure if there's another report that has been tabled since then on national security. And if there is, please correct me. So according to how they have been listed, I would say they've been listed depending on which one is a greater threat to the country, right? So the first one is general crime. The second one is terrorism. For terrorism and violent extremism, it's all about the mindset. What position the person is trying to pass across. And whatever they're believing, again, be it political, ideological, or religious, it's absolutely on the extreme side, right? And it's okay for someone to hold views that are on the extreme side. But the problem comes in when you're trying to make everyone get to where you are and you're using violence in the process of it, okay? A lot of us have very different and varying views, but you don't see us beating up each other. I'm sure there's something that you don't agree that she agrees about, right? but you're not fighting about it. The Center for Human Rights and Policy Studies is centered around terrorism mm. and what is called violent extremism, mm. right? So I think I, because of that, I'll spend a bit of time on this particular threat. Um, and just because of the fact that I think it's important for us to realize how homegrown this threat is and how close is it, it is. A lot of us are talking about attacks we've heard that have been sensationalized by the media because of maybe the region that they, 
he was involved in Nairobi Desert attack, Nairobi Westgate attack, right? Or Garissa University attack because of the veracity of the attack. But the truth of the matter is the attacks every day. Every day, right? And um, most of them are reported in the northeastern region, in the coastal region, in Lamu, Kwale, um, in Garissa, in Wajir, in Mandera. And a lot of these attacks go unreported. As part of the work that we do at the center is to document terror-related attacks and arrests in the whole country. So whatever is reported in the media, whatever is not reported in the media, maybe um, you have civil society organizations working at the ground mm. that do supplement information that you don't get to hear in the media, maybe because the attack was not on a mall that is frequented by people who are not Kenyan, for instance, you know. Um, so it needs you to go down and dig deeper, for instance. So when you're talking about security, it's not that you're looking at it from the top. You need to get down to the grassroots where you're reaching cases like what my sister here was talking about, right? And now you get to realize that you can't rely, for instance, on security forces alone to be able to responding, to be able to respond to these attacks and also to, to be documenting these attacks. Because for instance, the media um, standard cannot be sending people to Boni Forest when they know there's active battlefield going there. But as a policy maker, you need that data. You need to know how many people have been killed. Are they civilians? Are they security officials? Which kind of security officials are there? Are they military? Are they from the KDF? Are they from the National Police Service? Are they AP? Are they GSU who've just been, or KWS people who've just been sent there to do one thing? You know, it's really important to get down to the nitty gritty. And that's why when you're doing policy and security um, monitoring, you can't work with only one sector, right? You need to leverage on community-based organizations, religious-based organizations. Um, there'll be individuals who are in the community that people would much rather go to to give information and intelligence, for instance, than your ordinary policeman, yeah? You need to work with um, faith-based organizations as well because the reality of security issues is that a lot of the times, and because of reforms, because of history, if you, if you look at the security history, civilians are not likely to go and report matters to the security organs, right? So then, as someone who is in the policy space, as someone who is in leadership, it's important for you to realize that you cannot work alone. You need to get civil society on the table. You need to get women, youth groups on the table because they're the ones who live in these societies where they can pick up the push and pull factors, the motivational factors. Going down the list of uh, the threats, corruption is one of them. I think it was mentioned here. Cybersecurity, money laundering as well. I'm sure we're all familiar with um, Hush Puppy, right? Do we know Hush Puppy? Yes. Yahoo Boys? Yes. No? No? Okay, yes. tell us about Yahoo Boys. The crime that Hush Puppy was involving himself is in, in is actually called business email compromise. BEC in short, or account email compromise also, I think another term, because a lot of businesses, especially the big, farms conduct uh, transactions via email and digital wire transfers so they come in between that email after you guys have done your negotiations and you've agreed on amount, an amount to be paid and they ask you oh send us your email and your bank account details they then ingililia apo katikati and they compromise that email so that when whoever is sending the money to the other person it doesn't get there it instead goes to them so what, what you guys have talked about, Yahoo Boys and Hush Puppy, is exactly what they do. But the Yahoo Boys graduated to the email compromise, and that's what made them 
very popular yes and very famous so what they did was exactly what she was talking about so for instance Hilton is giving um, is getting a company to do their garbage collection so they pay them an X amount of money every quarter right so that company sends an invoice on the email so Yahoo boy has seen the transaction the negotiations mm -hmm. and seen the invoice so they send they compromise the email using the exact same email of the service provider, send an altered invoice to a Hilton telling them, actually, we've changed our payment details, send it to this address. And that's how they get money. So Hashwapi has been doing that all his life, <laughs> and that's how he got rich. So yes, uh, money laundering and cybercrime is a threat for the country. Organized criminal groups, political tension is actually also another threat. And uh, a lot of these threats are organized and also they're related to one another. So you can find, for instance, um, organized criminal groups being used in terror-related activities or being used in political tension, yeah? And drug trafficking as well, and you know, general crime. Security in learning institution was also one of the threats smuggling contraband and counterfeit products, illicit arms, that's also one of them. Uh, land fraud as well, I think that's pretty popular. Uh, wildlife security, environmental security, maritime security, border security as well, coupled with you know, uh, the insecurity that we're facing at the border. Gaming and betting, that's also a national security threat as of 2020. Labor unrest, disaster preparedness and management. This were very much lagging behind. Chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and high yield explosives. So the two last ones were East African community integration and regional security, because we can't think of Kenya just as a country that operates on its own, right? We have people crisscrossing the borders. These illicit arms are coming through the borders. People who are committing this Crimes can crisscross from Kenya to other places. We've seen that a lot. Um, I think for this section, for the threats, we're done. I think for me, this has been a really wonderful session, particularly the discussion point of view. I know we veered out of the main topic a few times, but it added a lot of value to the discussion today. And um, I hope that you've taken away a few things regarding national security and obviously the policy making process, which I think will be very, very instrumental as you move forward in the bigger offices that you will occupy.